Hello, everyone. Thank you so much um, for taking the time to join Building Publics. Humanity is combating isolation one more week, and particularly this week. Uh, one where the sadness of the novel health crisis that we have been living through collides with the sadness and the rage of the old crisis of racial injustice. Um, for those of you new to the series, my name is Maria Gonzalez Pendaz. I'm the coordinator of the Public Humanities Initiative of the SF Heyman Center for the Humanities at Columbia University and the organizer of this series. Today, I want to begin by noting my personal solidarity to the ongoing protests and my commitment uh, to better reckon with the et ethnic and racial injustices by which we live, uh, both our daily lives, but also in different ways, our academic lives. On that note, however, I want to acknowledge the SF Heyman's ongoing commitment to foster broader and more critical knowledge on issues of social injustice, including race, and its support of the scholars who are looking for ways to engage with publics beyond academia and to better think through the conditions of inequality that concern them. Much, of course, remains to be done, but such commitment is in fact what brings us together today and throughout this series and under the pub, uh, program of the Public Humanities Initiative, which I coordinate. Today is our fourth of six events featuring the work of our Public Humanities Graduate Students Fellows. Uh, this interdisciplinary group of emerging scholars have for the past year been working to develop projects that bridge humanistic thinking with civic engagement, scholarly research with community building. In the process, they have sought a quite critically and oftentimes quite creatively they have thought about ways to develop community ties and reciprocal knowledge. They have explored a variety of methods and media for public engagement that include digital technologies such as podcasts, GIS and virtual learning platforms, but also some Luddite approaches, if you will, such as walking and letter writing. And um, in doing so, they have addressed and we have together addressed what we are now pressing issues on the digital divide and the uneasy relationship that exists between digital and public humanities, they're very related, but they're not the same thing. And the implications of such a divide have been running through our discussion this year, and I think might be an issue for our conversation today specifically. In their presentations, our fellows will discuss how their projects have merged both from within the confines of their disciplines, but in a commitment to break out of academic silos. They will lay out their current thinking about the field of public humanities and how their work speaks to and can critically contribute to the challenges facing higher education today from present debates on devising new curriculum formats uh, and multimedia pedagogies uh, to even more pressing debates on how to more candidly address the social and economic inequities that continue to structure academia. These are all big issues that you all have been thinking through the specificity of your projects and through the seemingly small or prosaic challenges of implementing them. To address such issues, both big and small, presentations will be followed by responses by guests, including members of the various communities and organizations with which you have been working with. So um, we'll dedicate the last section uh, to a broader discussion and we will collect questions, feedback and ideas from everyone here um, uh, in the Zoom, uh, ideas that can help the future lives of these fascinating projects. And we plan the whole event um, to last a little over an hour today. So far we have discussed podcasting and GIS to explore how oral and graphic digital media can help tell new stories and reach new audiences. Today, we kind of remain in the realm of the digital, if only in part um, as an effect of COVID-19, to discuss how exhibitions and art objects can serve as a starting point to trigger collective conversations on cultural identity, and particularly around underrepresented but essential communities of Spanish-speaking and Latin indigenous New Yorkers. Such are the concerns of Alex Mendez, our fellow uh, presenter today. She is a PhD candidate in Latin American and Iberian cultures and the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society. Her research focuses on 16th century narratives about the new world and their circulation between the Americas, Spain and Venice. She entered uh, the Public Humanities Fellowship on the footsteps of her previous work as a fellow with the Mellon Sawyer Seminar on Global Language Justice 
and with a project that was invested in multilingual reading workshops. Over the course of the year and through fantastic multi-platform conversations with us at the Heyman Center and with many others out in the world, the project has morphed into something that we believe bridges her scholarly expertise on material culture with her career ambitions on the curatorial world and public pedagogy, yet without sacrificing the most critical aspects of her initial project, her commitment to develop meaningful cultural experiences that engages multicultural communities around issues of indigeneity and representation. Such Arc was in part indebted with her conversations with our guests today. Thank you so much for joining us. James Doyle uh, is an archeologist specializing in Asian Maya civilization and works as an assistant curator for the art of the Asian Americas at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He earned his PhD in anthropology at Brown University and his current exhibitions uh, include Arte del Mar, Artistic Exchange in the Caribbean, um, which is currently, yeah, we'll talk about how it's currently ongoing. Um, and the exhibition Lives of the Gods, Divinity in Maya Art in the works for 2022 with the Kimbo Art Museum. Doyle conducts fieldwork in Guatemala, including in association with the Met's long-term involvement with excavation and monument conservation at the site of Piedras Negras. Uh, we also count with the presence of Carissa Musialik. Uh, she has been a teacher in Title I schools for 12 years, no less. She was born and raised in the Dominican Republic and migrated to the US at the age of 15, where she studied Latin American and Spanish literature and received a master's in pedagogy. She's currently in her third year teaching at the Gregorio Luperon High School in Washington Heights, part of the DOE New York public system where she serves newcomers. We are extremely grateful uh, to have both of you here. Carissa, I am particularly in awe of you finding time and energy to join us as a mother of children in uh, elementary and middle school in the public system in New York. I have been in awe of you, the efforts that you've put to sort of um, you know, reinvent your teaching, mobilize platforms, devising thousands of uh, login systems uh, to make things happen. You know, it really has been inspiring for me you know, here at Columbia with all the resources, we're heading up hairs about how to keep things going and the lights on. And really, I mean, all of the work of uh, public school teachers this past couple of months. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna pass it on to uh, Alex. Um, as in the weeks past, please, uh, we ask that you remain uh, muted during their presentations and come back to life, both with your faces and the microphones for the conversation. We'll ask that you raise your hands digitally if you can, and that you use the chat box to send comments and questions in preparation for the conversation uh, later. Uh, the whole point of this is to generate feedback and new ideas together, so please do so. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Maria. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here, especially Garisa and James. I'm really, um, really grateful to have you here. Um, yeah, so Maria has really led our cohort of fellows this past year and challenged us to go out of our comfort zones, I would say, and I think that my project is definitely the better for it. Um, and of course, we have uh, this new challenge with the pandemic, but as I'll talk about in a minute, I think there's kind of some possibilities that open up there along with the challenges. Um, and I just want to reiterate uh, kind of what briefly, if you will, something that's in the, the background of all our, of our minds, what, what Maria was mentioning earlier, that this conversation is taking place against the backdrop of protests against the persecution, persecution and murder of Black people. Um, and I hope that this conversation can help us think about the long game. So how can we actively and continuously combat racist practices in our humanistic work and in our pedagogy? How can we work to break down barriers to access rather than reinscribe them? So these are kinds of some things that we might discuss in Q&A. Uh, so as Maria mentioned, this project began with the goal of 
celebrating indigenous art and cultures of the Americas and involving community members in New York City with ties to these cultures. And uh, it grew a little bit out of my work uh, with the Global Language Justice Initiative. So I'm going to show you guys briefly right now a map. And um, so this is from the Endangered Language Alliance. Um, and it shows it's only one part of a big map of linguistic map of New York City that they have of uh, just showing the variety of languages, including indigenous languages from all over the world that are spoken in New York City alone, right? And I sort of zoomed in on more or less upper Manhattan area, uh, which I think Columbia University, of course, these are our neighbors, if you will. Um, so that's kind of how, uh, kind of the germ of, of, of some of this in the beginning. And the project went through a number of iterations in conversation with Maria and others, including our um, guest uh, speakers at the workshop series in the fall. And one of the main goals of the project has been to encourage the agency of young Latino New Yorkers um, and invite them to see themselves as producers of art and knowledge and invite them into venerated museum spaces like the Met where they may think that they don't belong um, and help them see that that's not the case. Uh, so my approach is informed by several thinkers, but uh, Dora Summer is definitely one of them. Uh, she has this book, The Work of Art in the World, and talks about cultural agency and the importance of, of play in, in producing knowledge and reacting to. Um, she talks particularly about text, but we can think about art as well. So I began designing a workshop series in the fall in which Latino high school students would create these artistic and humanistic responses to indigenous art and museums and would try their hand at curation as well. Um, and another goal has been to challenge these hierarchies, right, to value the knowledge that can be produced by association and memory, and in addition to the knowledge that can be produced by research and in institutions with name recognition. So in order to effectively reach the communities I wanted to reach, I knew it would be important to offer workshops in Spanish, if at all possible. Um, and the communities with the closest ties to indigenous languages and cultures of the Americas, I reasoned, would be more likely to be comfortable speaking in Spanish rather than English. Um, there's basically, I kind of want to bring home the fact that this is the fruit of collaboration <laughs> um, and that there are so many people um, that sort of made this possible and, and, and brought me to who you see here. Um, Daniela Gitlin, I see you there. Thank you very much for putting me in touch with Carissa. Um, Adam Capitano put me in touch with Daniela uh, to begin with. Joanne Pillsbury and Lisa Trevor were also part of this. There's a lot of people in the backstory to making this happen. Um, so, so essentially, um, the pandemic hit and we couldn't have workshops in person. So I was faced with rethinking what I had once conceived of as these in-person workshops. And I decided to make an asynchronous teaching module, which I'll show you in a minute, that high school teachers could use. Um, and this opened up the possibility that more students, in fact, could experience this virtual field trip and participate in the workshops than originally we had been thinking. Um, so I had to be flexible with the format and even the purpose of the project a little bit because I was hoping to kind of help out teachers and students um, at this time. Uh, but the question is, how, how do I, how, how are we really, you know, how, how do you do that? Um, how do you be most helpful? And if this is part of, going to be part of the high school curriculum, you know, um, then what, then suddenly the project takes on a little bit more of a pedagogical role than it had uh, initially, sort of. Uh, and that's something that I'm sort of learning to embrace a little bit too. And it means that the humanistic training that I have at the university is valuable to a certain extent, but it's also really important to be listening to people like Garissa, who are much better versed in the needs of the high school students, you know, that I'm trying to engage. 
So that was one challenge. Uh, another consideration was about accessibility. So I was thinking, do these students have access to reliable Wi-Fi? Are they going to be looking at this module on their computer or on the phone? Um, and I made the module initially in English and then I made it into Spanish as well, um, which was part of the initial project. And in Spanish, um, for a variety of reasons, there's only one short video, the rest is sort of images and text. And um, I'm really curious to see what people think about this, but I think in this age where, you know, everything's gone digital and there's a lot of kind of like really high tech things that we can do, um, how do we engage people who maybe don't have access to the most high tech or the biggest bandwidth and this kind of a thing? Um, so these are all sort of considerations that I've had. So what I'm going to do is two things. I'm going to put in the chat the, um, the links to the um, English and Spanish versions of the module and, um, and the exhibit at the Met uh, online, um, the website. But uh, that's just kind of so you have it. Don't worry about kind of like going through it right now because I'm going to show you in a PowerPoint basically what the, I'll go through and show you what the, what the module is. Uh, so here, yeah. So there you guys uh, have kind of what it is. Um, So let me go back to the PowerPoint here. So this is what the beginning of it looks like, right? Um, I'm gonna be using the English and the Spanish version sometimes, depending. Um, so you can see it has kind of four parts to it, a little bit of a exhibition walkthrough, trying to kind of like recreate a vir virtual field trip type of experience, an exploration kind of a little bit more in depth of the objects gallery by gallery, if you will. And then um, a prompt where uh, students actually create their own art in response to the art that they are seeing and a prompt where they actually curate their own exhibition. Now, not all of these things have to happen or they could happen sequentially. It could be, um, you know, different modules altogether. Um, this is sort of all of it at once, what I'm presenting to you now. Um, so this is kind of, um, James provided me with some installation photos that were really helpful, especially if I'm not going to have um, a really great video at, in English that he did that I would highly recommend <laughs> that, um, that goes through the exhibit beautifully. Kind of in lieu of that, uh, you know, these installation photos give you a little bit of a sense of the exhibition. Um, and here is where I kind of wanted to start involving students in thinking about themselves and their own relationship to the art. So, um, you know, I use this map. Uh, all of these images are, are from the Met. Um, so uh, I'm using this map uh, and saying, you know, do you have a personal connection to these places? You know, because these are the places that this art is coming from. It's from 500 years ago or more. Um, but it's it's it does have to do with you it's not not about you you know so this is kind of an entry into thinking about that um so then i go on and try to go gallery by gallery and uh, this is also a way of trying to from a pedagogical standpoint explain a little bit of what the role of a curator is if i'm going to have them do you know a curatorial workshop um at the end and so they basically go through and have, there's links to the website at the Met that has, um, you know, here's the, the link you can see, um, that has the, the four main galleries. So there's ritual knowledge, ceremonial performance, political power, ancestral Caribbean legacy. So this is what, how James has envisioned, uh, you know, the exhibit. And I hope he will speak a little bit about this uh, a little bit later, his whole vision for it. Um, so if you, if just so you can see how the website works, if you open up one of them, it has a little bit more information, right? This is talking about the concept of semi, which is really important to the exhibition. Uh, and then there's some examples of the artworks that go under that particular category. 
and it's a relatively small exhibition, but there's a lot packed into it. Um, and, and, and so these, this is how it's organized physically. And then the website sort of recreates that. So what the module is doing is kind of like in, in a teaching, you know, from a teaching perspective, going through and, um, and trying to guide students. Um, and so basically I came up with these particular questions and prompts, and I do want to go through a little bit about how I came up with these. Um, and uh, there was one person from, uh, from, from oral history, Amy, I don't know how you pronounce her last name, Amy from the oral history program in, in um, the master's program at Columbia was really helpful in thinking about questions. Um, and prompts and thinking about um, especially, uh, you know, how do you get people to think, to respond to things? How do you ask good questions? And, um, and then, you know, uh, when you think about um, getting someone to actually create an artistic uh, response to something, how do you make that sort of seem manageable? So um, there's a, I'm trying to strike a balance here basically a little bit between the, the kind of instructive, you know, did you understand what a semi is? Did you read the text? Did you <laughs> sort of get it? But then really like, how does this relate to you? Again, like with the map, you know, can you think of something in your life um, that you've experienced that's similar to a semi that maybe holds a similar function or something like that? Uh, and later on when we talk about um, ceremonial, um, objects, you know, are there objects of luxury or ceremonial objects, you know, uh, or what in the section on political power objects that, you know, speak to power? Are there objects like that that you can think of um, in your life that you've seen that you've experienced? Um, thing it's in your house, things that your family owns, maybe, you know, that you can relate to this. Um, so uh, what happens here is basically I uh, encourage people to look at a particular object on the website and really look at it closely. Think about why does it stand out to them? Why are they interested in it? You know, what does it remind them of? So I'm trying to trigger these ideas about memory and association. Um, that's kind of what's happening here. And then I am encouraging them if they are going to participate in the curatorial part uh, to kind of keep that object that they've selected from the particular gallery in a different tab and just kind of hold on to it. At, and then at the end, um, and then at the end, they'll use it. So the fourth gallery is a little bit different because there's one painting in it, which is this painting by Wilfredo Lam. Uh, right. And so the, the question I put here is, uh, how did Wilfredo Lam, how is he inspired by ancestral Caribbean art? Right, and um, one important thing that Garisa had mentioned is that sometimes it's important for students to have uh, models or examples of, of something, of what to do. And, um, and I've been thinking about this because I wonder how do we make a model or an example without prescribing what you're supposed to do, you know? And I think the Wifredo Lam painting could be an interesting jumping off point because, you know, uh, you're not t saying to someone, well, you have to make a painting like this, but this painting is an example of, you know, how someone can take these different forms and these different motifs that you've been seeing in the exhibition um, and make something that's their own out of it, you know, um, which is what happens in this part where it's you're the artist, right? You, you choose an example, uh, sorry, you choose an object and you decide that you're going to make something artistic as a response. And thinking about this um, conversation in our oral history se session, I really wanted to, at the same time, circumscribe, you know, limit a little bit what, what you're supposed to be doing, but also keep it open for people who might be more comfortable with one thing than another. So, you know, I love writing. I would immediately gravitate to number four, write a short piece in which you describe a scene and tell a very short story. Other people would be terrified by that they might say, okay, I'll make an image. Some people would be terrified by that. Record an audio file. Some people, you know, maybe that's their thing. Make a very short film. I mean, maybe they're just like, you know, they love TikTok. So I'm trying to give a little bit of, you know, room here so that people can do what they um, are most comfortable doing, you know, and, and come up with something that responds to the particular object that they've chosen 
because of their own associations. And then finally, the you're the curator part um, is where basically if they've gone through and done this for, uh, you know, the three, uh, the three galleries, in addition to the fourth one, which is the Wilfredo Lam painting. Um, and Wilfredo Lam is a, is, a, um, is a Cuban artist, I should say, of the 20th century. Um, uh, then, uh, then I invite them to put these um, objects together and think about how do they go together? And wh what if you put your own piece of artwork alongside these? And so I'm basically inviting people to think a little bit like a curator and, and think, you know, why did you select the objects that you, that you chose? Do they have anything in common? If so, what? You know, how would you create a narrative about, about these objects? So that's um, basically the module. And um, right now I want to open the floor up to uh, first James Doyle and then Carissa um, Musialik. And uh, so James, um, would you like to tell us a little bit about your vision uh, for the exhibition and how you see this virtual field trip and workshop as fitting in with or complementing the project of the exhibition as a whole and the digital resources, the, the many digital resources that you have, including the augmented reality semi of the original one, you know, um, kind of how does this fit in with all of that and what challenges and possibilities do you see arising um, from that? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm James Doyle, and thanks for having me today. And thanks to Alex for doing this great work. And it really sort of is um, always a goal as someone putting together a project like this that it resonates with educators. And it really reaches the community, especially in New York, because um, the Metropolitan Museum is not a national thing. It's a New York City uh, institution. And so um, that's sort of always on our minds that we want to reach new audiences within New York City. And that was one of the, the many considerations for planning Art Belmar. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of the, the I'll give the, the nerdy in, <laughs> inspiration is really that um, the art and archaeology of the pre-colonization Caribbean region is rather underdeveloped and as far as a field of study. Um, and uh, as, as Maria said, my specialty is in the uh, Maya region, which is Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, uh, and Belize. But, uh, you know, the archaeology of the Antilles has not gotten as much attention as you see in Mesoamerica or in South America. And I had worked on a couple of prior projects that sort of brought me to this um, idea. And when I was given the opportunity to program something in this sort of uh, medium-sized gallery, uh, I proposed a look at the regional traditions of the Caribbean, which is kind of the new hook, um, which it has not been done. You, uh, there have been wonderful exhibitions in the past on the art of the Tainos, of course, um, but uh, or of uh, things like goldworking in Colombia. But uh, I wanted to kind of bridge the conversation and center the narrative around the sea as a connecting uh, agent rather than a passive surface that people were crossing because it really is um, something that uh, re really brought people together for, for centuries, if not millennia, before uh, Europeans uh, colonized the region. So um, that was sort of the intellectual pursuit, but also um, practically this is the 150th year of the Metropolitan Museum. And so um, my department uh, was asked to do something that would celebrate uh, the collection in this context. And so I thought to really focus on the heritage of the Caribbean region uh, would be uh, an added value to this uh, whole conversation happening around the Met having been here for 150 years. Um, and since the, the collection of the museum actually counts on very uh, iconic mm -hmm. examples from Taina wooden sculpture all the way to mm -hmm. Panamanian gold eagle pendants to um, wonderful stonework from Costa Rica, it was uh, celebrating the collection that's there and, and really saying that this is very special to have, um, of course, in New York for people to see. Um, but uh, really something that was very important to me from the beginning and um, 
you know, this is being recorded, so I won't go into the gritty details, but really things that I had to fight for um, were, uh, was to have uh, bilingual resources, of course, which is uh, what led <laughs> um, the Alex's project to go so well with what we had done um, from the exhibition side, uh, but also, uh, it's it was small decisions, you know, like the Spanish title is the first one in an exhibition in 150 years, which seems shocking um, when I say that. But, um, you know, and for example, we have the introductory text also in Spanish on the wall, uh, which hasn't been done in a while. But of course, when I was presented with the argument, well, there's no precedent for that. And I said, well, actually, here's some images from 1973 of La Rencia Artística de Puerto Rico, two languages on the wall. Um, that was a collaboration with El Museo del Barrio. So the Met has sort of a spotty history of engaging with bilingual gallery content. And so I was happy to um, have the introduction there. I, I basically, I said, look, I want people to come here. And if somebody brings their abuelita that can't read English, I want her to know what she's going to see. Um, and even if uh, the space is constrained, um, as you can see once you see the exhibition, so we couldn't really do all the text in both languages. It just would be overwhelming. And I wanted people to really appreciate the artwork. Um, but uh, it was really important for me to have that uh, introductory panel in Spanish, just so that someone who was a, a primary a Spanish speaker um, could know what they were getting into. And that's really about New York City. I wasn't, I had to very much emphasize, I was not talking about tourists and talking about the 25% of New York City that speaks Spanish in the household. I mean, this is probably even more with the 2020 census. Um, you know, this is from 2010. And um, specifically, I had to really fight because if you're thinking about audience development, um, for example, the, the uh, borough of the Bronx, um, over, you know, it's around 40% of households that speak Spanish. And um, half of those are primarily Spanish, limited English profici proficiency. And when you look at the data of the New York City, the millions of New York City people that come to the museum, only 5% of New York City visitors come from the entire borough of the Bronx. And so mm -hmm. that was just a sort of example that I gave to the administration saying, this is just an inclusive gesture. This isn't going to be a magic bullet so that everybody who speaks Spanish from the Bronx is gonna show up at the Met, but this is really something that we have to do better. Um, and another thing just coming from, from what um, Alex said about uh, how we can sort of really push our institutions to do better about things, especially right now when um, it's clear that these small decisions can change minds and can make a difference. Um, and uh, when, it, when it comes down to life or death, I mean, it's really something that um, it's not being overdramatic, obviously looking around us. Um, things like uh, Alex said in her sort of email, um, you know, I had to argue that we should keep violent as a modifier for colonial rule in the Caribbean, um, when in fact, it's just sort of stating a fact. Um, I'm just trying to be straightforward about what occurred. Um, but, you know, some, there was some resistance to that. Um, and also, you know, here I am an archaeologist, I, you know, um, I'm sort of a, an interloper at the Metropolitan in that way. <laughs> I've never taken an, an art history class. I mean, no, I, I don't know modern painters. I mean, um, you got me, right? Uh, I, I'm learning, I have to say. In my six years at the Metropolitan, I've learned a lot. Um, but I, I really wanted to create the final moment in that it's a bridge to the present because I want, you know, as an archaeologist, I'm, I love the story of the connectedness and the sharing of knowledge and migrations of people and ideas in the past. Um, but I think it's a little tone deaf if we don't have an, uh, an acknowledgement of the descendant communities in New York City and in um, the Caribbean region today. And so that was why what led me, and I, I'm so grateful for my colleagues that um, helped me with my quest to get the Wifredo Lam painting um, in the exhibition and especially to the Guggenheim Museum for, for lending it uh, for the whole year. But uh, it just seemed to me a way that we could uh, create a conversation, start that conversation about how have 
not only Caribbean artists and artists in the Caribbean diaspora um, contributed to modern and contemporary art because it's one of the most lively and productive areas in contemporary art, of course, uh, but also, you know, how are the ancestral traditions of the Caribbean uh, alive in artistic practice in the 20th century and the 21st. And um, what I love about the Wifredo Lam painting is that people uh, see it and they see the forms in the painting it, that resonate with the ancestral works, but he wasn't necessarily looking at Taino art. He wasn't necessarily looking at uh, this metate from Costa Rica, even though the forms resonate. Um, he was thinking about this surreal world of Santeria and voodoo and these West African traditions that incorporated indigenous practices as they spread through the Antilles. And um, what I really wanted to do was kind of build off recent research that shows that the story of Taino Ness is much more complicated than we learn in school. And after about 1540, it's really a story of Afro-Indigenous practices in the islands. And so um, it was really exciting for me to kind of build that bridge to the present. And I think the response has been great because I think people think, oh, you know, this is something that I didn't think about, you know. Um, and so I liked having that unexpected aspect to it. And I also thought, um, you know, it was great to, um, it's, it's just visually, you can see the painting for both sides. So it's pulling people in that may not, may have walked on by the archeological works in the show, but mm -hmm. you can really pull in different audiences as well. Um, so that's really kind of a, a brief rundown of the inspiration of the exhibition. And I'll just talk about the online presence as well uh, a little bit um, because that is something that people can check out. Um, uh, with the bilingual introduction panel in the gallery, I um, made it very clear that I wanted to build out a, a English and Spanish web presence for the exhibition. And that will be a permanent thing so that people in the future can use that as a resource. Um, and we had piloted that project with an exhibition from 2018 called Golden Kingdoms. <laughs> Um, so there was precedent, you know, that was uh, a word that got thrown around. So, um, and uh, so that worked really well. And what was funny because they changed the website a little bit so that it's mobile adaptive or mobile friendly. And so it didn't quite work on desktop. And so I just said, all right, we're putting the Spanish labels first. <laughs> so if you go to the objects, you can see the Spanish and then you have to click more for the English. Um, just little things that can be subversive. Um, That's great. Yeah, and uh, James, uh, wait, James. Um, I, we are at time a little bit. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can stop there. I'll stop. So. I, I think that's a high note to. <laughs> but if you have more to say, please, uh, we have a little bit of time in in Q and A. Um, but yes, there's a there's a lot of um, digital resources Absolutely, that yeah. made this project even possible. So. Um, I just want to, uh, yeah, see, um, I would, I would really like to hear, um, from Carissa, uh, about, um, your interest in, in this project and, um, and, you know, kind of the, some of the feedback and suggestions that, uh, that you have about it and how you envision incorporating it into the curriculum when you teach, uh, your students who, are Spanish speakers and not English speakers in the fall. Um, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on that, yeah. Hi, so the reason why I really love your project um, it has to do with that, well, most of the students that I teach are uh, Hispanic. 90% of them are Dominican descent. Um, my school, as it was mentioned before, is in Washington Heights and it's a school of no commerce. So everybody there speaks Spanish, mainly. Um, I'm, so grateful to be in that school because by the end you can see the transformation of the kids that they come out speaking English. But anyway, the first uh, I teach with freshmen and the first thing that we talk about is identity. Uh, so your project will go into that um, if God permits. Um, so uh, because um, we do this project so they can see to, to teach them how to love themselves, to see, uh, to teach them about themselves, about the world, and um, the relationship with others. Um, so we talk about their heritage, their history, so they can be proud of where they're coming from and, and, and love who they are and be feel, feel proud of the person that they are when they're here. Um, so 
uh, in this project, we talk about the Latin American history and we do it through, well, sorry, in my class, we, do, we talk about Latin American history. We talk about it through art, through short stories and over text. And I, as I was telling you before, the reason why I'm very interested about what you're doing is because we have limited, limited information about Tainos and, and um, what is the other group? And Caribes, for example. So we, we talk about the Mayas, we talk about the Incas, we talk the, about the Aztecs, but these are not group that, groups that they're familiar with. These are not groups that they study when they were in the island. They study about their people. And when they come here, we don't have a lot of information about it. So that's one thing that I battle with. Uh, so this is very exciting to me. Um, and um, thank you, James, for putting that together because now they have a chance to look at their history in a New York City museum. So this will be uh, very welcomed by them. Um, and yeah, also I really like the model because uh, in the way that you, that you did it, it allows them to explore the information, to analyze it, to reflect and to create. Mm -hmm. And those four words are very important as a teacher because those are the higher rankings in the Bloom Taxonomy, mm -hmm. creating right? Becoming what, well, creating what you learn. So that's why I really, really enjoy your project and I am looking forward to implementing it in my classroom. Thank you. Alex, can I just intercept before you move Please. on to getting questions? Please. I'll just, just throw a few comments. One, it's fascinating to see how throughout the three conversations, this connection between the small challenges that each of you find to implement your projects, you know, from the smallness of the small label on a wall, um, uh, you know, to, to, to throw in these connections. You know, it's the small challenges of how to implement this project that is speak the loudest of the big issues that you're really raising on questions in particular here of identity, indigeneity, and uh, multiculturalism in New York. And the great work that needs to be done, you know, to bring that to the fore. But also I want to commend you for building sort of an institutional alliance that really reaches across, no? between you, the sort of emerging scholar, um, bringing the humanities perspective with the Met, that it can be called, you know, like a um, elite public institution um, with the public public system, it seems to me a very successful, there's much work to be done in bringing this to fruition, but I, but I wanna commend you on the building of this, of this uh, uh, institutional alliance. Uh, because it seems to me here that it's not sort of the old thing like, oh, let me bring this Columbia project, you know, to a particular community, mm, you know, that Carissa brings forth, but that each of your project complement each other. So that James, but you being able to say to your institution, you know, we're building a new audience, we're bringing uh, students from these communities, it's going to help you in your next project as you sort of redefine the public within the Met. So it's, it's really um, a sort of a multi-directional reciprocal production of knowledge in the best way possible as far as I'm concerned. And with that, I'm going to leave um, uh, others to ask questions and Alex, you too. Yeah. 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 And I just wanted to say that, um, that James and Carissa have been sort of ideal partners in this as well, especially in the, in the linguistic aspects, because as you were saying, James, this was like an integral part of the conception of the exhibit in the first place. Um, and Carissa, you were, you know, uh, really insistent to me if this is going to work it has to be in Spanish you know there's there's no other way to reach the, the these communities you know um, and and that's great I mean because that's a that's a celebration of the multilingualism that's not you know thinking of it as some kind of obstacle you know what I mean um, so I just wanted to say that yeah um, I guess we have a, a question here uh, Almu is asking, uh, I wonder if you can speak a little bit more about the legitimization of Spanish as a lengua de cultura in the U.S. Okay, oh, that's, that's a huge topic. Um, I don't know, Almu, do you want to speak a little bit with audio mm. about <laughs> what you're thinking about? <laughs> sure, I mean, I was just thinking, um, 
I mean, I'm from Spain. My first language is not English, but I still am writing a dissertation in English just because I am living in the U.S. and I am uh, working for now in the American Academia. Um, but also because I feel that if I were to write my dissertation in Spanish, it wouldn't have the same legitimation uh, in the cultural field or in the academic field. So I think that this project is fantastic because it doesn't present uh, the language. I mean, Spanish just as a tool for communication, but also I'm um, building on what uh, Karina was, Carissa was saying uh, on the um, kind of the creative capacity that we hope that students develop when they get to, you know, to, to the maximum level of the learning goals that we are thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I had the feeling at Columbia while I was teaching Spanish that many of our students were learning the language thinking in a very utilitarian manner. Mm -hmm. You know, I just need to learn this language because I, I will need this for my job. But the approach that you are taking is that you are letting these students that, I mean, whose, whose native language is Spanish to express themselves in their language. So my question in that respect is, is this adv advancing a little bit in the legitimation of Spanish as a language that is suitable for, for culture? I didn't know how to say lengua y cultura in English. <laughs> so that's why. Well, that's a perfect example, right? <laughs> yeah. Precisely, <laughs> yeah. I, I think this is a great point. I was particularly taking, James, when you're explaining that you have to legitimize that the title or the labels there for questions of, um, you know, legibility. But of course, that's what you need to say. I mean, and, and again, this is the relationship between a, a small and big. What you say to reach communities or to build in institutional alliances, it's both related but also different from the cultural goals that are attained, you know? So this is what you might need to say. No, people need to understand what they're reading. But it goes way beyond uh, legibility of a broader audience. It goes into the fact that your students, Carissa, go to the Met and find themselves unmediated by translation, legitimized. Yeah, absolutely. To a certain level. Yeah. And I would, I would only add that the title discussion was especially important to me because um, I, I think it's a more beautiful title in Spanish than anything I could come up with in English because of the level, the layers of the preposition de, because you have mm -hmm. of or from or belonging to or pertaining to. It's, it's mm -hmm. got a lot of poetic power just using that preposition that is lost when you try to translate it into English. And I, and it, I wanted that central concept to be about the sea bringing people together. And so, um, you know, I finally just kind of had to say, we're, let's do this. It's <laughs> just trust me. And then, you know, of course, like I, I'm the first person to send the New York Times review where he actually calls out that language in the title. So it's, it's people notice these things, yeah. exactly as you say. Yeah, and I think, um, Anmu, you were talking a little bit also about like, uh, you know, the pedagogical stakes of this, of, you know, why do you learn a language, you know? And if, if you come here, you know, uh, there's an expectation to learn English that's, that one might say is almost forced, right? Um, or to write in English, in your case, write a whole dissertation, a whole book in a language <laughs> that's not your own, you know? <laughs> um, uh, and, and I think it was really interesting, Garisa, what you brought up of these, these four things, explore, analyze, reflect, and create. And I think it's important to think about how you can do that in every language and how it might look different in different languages. You know, like, like what you were talking about, James, with, you know, the pre preposition de, and, and, and you were talking about lengua de cultura, you know, what, how, do, how exactly would you translate that? Um, yeah, I have to say the translation actually was a fascinating aspect of just, uh, I'm a second language Spanish speaker. Um, and so it was great to bring in um, different voices when we were looking at the translation because, you know, for a more academic word like endementaria, that's really what I'm talking about with these things. But then, you know, ha having a couple of people from that from Puerto Rico say, but no one would ever say that. So why don't you just say vestimenta? which is like much more, uh, it's still conveying the same meaning, but it doesn't have this kind of like 
esoteric, you know, feel to it. So it was really great to work through those questions. Mm -hmm. And it, as you said, Almu really legitimized Spanish as a way to convey this information. I think what you're talking about too, a little bit is like the translation also as like part of the project of bridging the distance, right? Like it's not enough to simply render something in Spanish, you know, it's about really trying to access how would people speak and how would people understand this. Yeah, and just as one example that I loved, um, in the sort of anthropological sense, performance hmm. is a great word in English, but it doesn't translate well in Spanish because you have, you, you have words that really mean acting or playing a role that you're not. And that's not what I was saying. And so I think in the end we came up with, um, what, what was it? El, el despliegue ceremonial. El despliegue ceremonial, which is like you're displaying who you are and who you are claiming to be. And that's really sort of capturing it in Spanish in a way that uh, perform something that's a literal translation of performance wouldn't really get there. Yeah, I will say we're going to have to start closing up. There is an interesting question oh. um, by Julian on precisely on bringing up these issues of ritual that are part of the exhibition and with some interesting ideas on how perhaps um, folding ritual and performance in the pedagogical aspect would add a whole other level no? to the experience. Like the objects pertain ritualistic practices, the exhibition is a ritual, ritualistic practices of, you know, of curatorial consciousness, if you will. Anyway, I think it'd be very interesting to think through some of these um, aspects of you know, what would it mean to bring in the students in a more active, performative, even ritualistic mm. um, exercises? Mm. That's a big question. <laughs> yeah, thank No, yeah. thank you. I had missed that in the chat. Yeah, thank you. It's a, it, Maybe yeah. this is a follow-up uh, comment on that. I think it's a very wonderful thing that we're thinking about translation and, and that you're also thinking about, Alexandra, on the idea of the multimedia, like allowing people to engage with multimedia responses to the module. And so my question there would be how the multimedia could also be thought about as a form of translation, since a lot of people are not, um, like the visual is not the only way of communicating the full meaning of, the, of these ceremonial objects, obviously. So there's so much more that can be thought of in the act of translation that goes beyond just mm -hmm. the Spanish language, uh, uh, you know, a binary. There's so much more there that could be um, put into practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know. I have some preliminary thoughts there. I think that one of the big um, um, challenges is not necessarily just about the technology, but about the, the, the fact that we're with our families and we're not like with our classmates, you know, like I think this kind of performance thing, there's an element of, of collectivity to it as well, oftentimes, you know. Of, of getting together with at least two or three other people. So I think that's, a, it's not a very well developed thought yet, but I'm just thinking that's one of the challenges. Yeah, Maria? Alex, I'm gonna ask that you hold on to those thoughts until next week because okay. Mev McHugh, who's here and Erin Petrella, we will be talking about pedagogical formats that they have been developing in the context of justice education and prison education that bring in both artistic practices, literary practice and issues of performance. Uh, so I think we'll be hearing from some experts on the issue next week and you may be able to draw some connections and some ideas from their examples. Uh, I mean, that's also part of the hope of, of the ongoing series, no? Mm -hmm. That we draw from one another's uh, small actions to bring some of these big issues. Um, but I am sure that we're gonna have to start closing this, what I hope it's the beginning of many more conversations, both specific to your project and its implementation in the future, which we may be able to come back to, but also James and Carissa of possible future co uh, conversations with other fellows and other projects. It's really wonderful to be able to have you, you know, um, as a resource. Uh, so thank you so much for your support through the year and for the conversation to you. Before, uh, in the spirit of translations and, and cross references, before we totally adjourn, I want to introduce everyone to Dimitris Antonio. He's a friend of mine, a regular to our series, a scholar of Hellenic studies and politics of space, and the director, associate director of the Stavros Niajos Foundation Public Humanities Initiative that is going on at Columbia. 
And I really want everybody to know a little bit about that initiative so that, you know, communications and conversations begin to develop. I'm going to uh, let you present the project, Dimitris, a little bit before we close. Yeah, thank you, Maria, and thank you, Alex, for the presentation. So this is a new uh, Columbia Public Humanities initiative that I'm running with uh, Mark Mazauer and and our and we're we're hoping to do two things. One is to to support individuals and grassroots organizations who are pursuing public humanities, currently pursuing public humanities projects in Greece. So we have um, already have our first cohort of project awardees, and you'll find the uh, description of those projects on our website and also at the same time to, to uh, support public-facing initiatives that promote Hellenic studies uh, on campus and in uh, New York. And uh, so I invite you, everyone, I don't want to take much of your time, I, I invite you, everyone, to uh, check our uh, website so that you find more information about the projects that we're currently supporting in Greece, but also the new uh, summer grant scheme uh, for remote uh, online uh, work in public humanities, uh, which uh, supports collaboration with uh, either projects that we support in Greece or um, uh, independent uh, or the pursuing of, of independent projects in the larger field of, of Hellenic studies. And as we're in the process of, of uh, putting together our, uh, uh, events and activities for next year, I invite you all to uh, subscribe to our newsletter and reach out to us for uh, ideas and suggestions. We want to, we're trying to uh, incorporate the initiative into the existing larger Columbia Public Humanities networks and we very much look forward to being in touch with everyone. So I'm gonna um, share the address with uh, everyone here and Right. in the chat box and uh, thank you Maria for giving me the opportunity to to say a few words about the initiative and the opportunities that we offer yeah yeah of course the hope is that there will be more uh, synergies now with the projects uh, so thank you Dimitris I'm sorry that we have to close the conversation I know we could go on forever but I've also I've been doing this for uh, a month and a half now I know that zoom spans are limited as they should be um, so this is just like an appetizer, no? To much more uh, to come. So I want to now um, invite you to our panel next week, same time on Wednesday. We will feature the projects of Erin Petrella, also from the Classics Department, and Meth McHugh, and she'll be able to correct my, um, you know, the way that I say your name. Uh, next week um, on their explorations on pedagogies and performances in justice. We're super excited. Um, I see you there, uh, Mav, in the screen. So super excited about next next week. Uh, I look forward to seeing everyone again. Same e, uh, Zoom link. For now, please join me in thanking Alex, James, and Carissa for your time and your enthusiasm in this project. It's fascinating. Please. Do go ahead with it, Carissa. Please implement it in your classroom. Um, I will do. I will do. I will send her a uh, a uh, an example once they complete it. <laughs> yes, yes, and come back when the museum opens up. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Let's keep off in there. I do a project about social revolution, and they have paintings by Rivera and things like that. So we do go to the we go to the MoMA. We work with the MoMA, and we work with. Uh, the American, oh, I forgot the name, uh, the, the Hispanic on. Society of Hispanic America, Society right? Hispanic Society of America, yes, yeah. the Hispanic Society of America, because we like, my, my school works a lot with community organizations, like the bookstore that is in the front, that's how I met Alexandra, uh, I'm a volunteer there, and my kids go to recite poetry there, so it's, we, it's, it's a whole community effort to make sure that these kids are well-rounded and, and that they are ready to succeed. That's how we bring equity. That is how we bring equity, Carissa. Thank you. It's, it's again, I'm going to repeat what I said at the beginning. Inspiring and amazing, the hard work that you do for, for all the children. All the children, not only the children that you, that you serve more directly, but really um, our youth. Uh, in New York. So thank you everyone for your commitment to such just causes. And thank you everyone for taking the time today uh, to be here. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you for having me. <laughs>